that's all the announcements I have for this morning. So as we arrive in this time and place, let's take a moment uh, to acknowledge the land and awaken to its true history. The Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Manhattan holds this land within a context of ongoing settler colonialism and the dispossession of indigenous peoples and nations from their lands. May we wake up and stay awake to these truths which are so consistently hidden and ignored. It is not time to light the chalice. As we light this chalice, these are words from W.E.B. Du Bois. As we light this chalice, the prayer of our souls is for persistence not for the one good deed or single thought, but deed on deed and thought on thought until day calling unto day shall make a life worth living. May it be so. It's time for the story for all ages. So if children would come up here uh, and the symbol on the stage, we've got some things to do. Are there any more kids who'd like to come here? Okay. Well, Carl, do you know your address? Okay. Well, uh, our address right here in the Unitarian Fellowship is 481 Zenedale Road. I'm going to write that up here on the, on the uh, paper that we have. Okay. Carl, is that enough? 481 Zendale Road. Is that our complete address here? And older kids out here in the audience, up to, to those, including those in your 70s and 80s. It seems to be missing stuff. It seems to be, it seems to be missing something. What is it missing? Where do we live? Manhattan. And after Manhattan, we always put Kansas. Now, what do we use an address for? Why do you need an address? So the, the mail carrier can know this? Yeah, that's right. And so your friends can know too where to go. But uh, now the mail carrier though, might not be from around here and might say, where is this? K.S. Do you know where K.S. is on the globe? That's the circle. Yeah. And over here. I think it's, I think it's the one where the K sunflower on it. Like. Oh, yeah. Now, this globe probably doesn't have our own sunflower on it. But somewhere around here, there should be a little KS, and your eyes are sharper than mine. It's going to be right around here. So it's a K and an S? 
Well, I think it's that guy right there, but I'm not sure. Well, okay. Do you know what uh, this place is called? What do you call this place on the globe? Kansas. Uh, Kansas is right there. And if the mail carrier said, okay, so I'm supposed to go to Kansas, should I go to Africa? No. Uh, should I go to Australia? No. Where should I go? Manhattan. Manhattan. <laughs> yeah. Well, but there might be a Manhattan in, in Africa too. What? Oh, the United States of America. Yeah, that that's pretty good. That's pretty good. That, that let's add that to the list. Sandy, would you write that down? I'll try. I got it. I got it. Okay. All right, we're getting a pretty good address here. But you might run out of paper. I might, but you know what? I got more. Sandy is not going to run out of paper. I promise you that. States. Yeah, thank you. Should we go the whole way? Sure. Okay, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. But suppose our robot mail carrier. <laughs> no, not you. We're going to ask you and you some questions about our that our robot mail carrier would need to know. So is this United States of America on Mars? Is it on Jupiter? Doug, would you give me a, a slide of the solar system, please? Well, there we go. So there's Mercury and there's Venus. That's Earth, that's right. So we need to add to our address here, United States of America, Earth, the third planet from the sun in our solar system. You know what we, what we call? That's, that's right, the sun. Yeah, the sun is a, is a star. Ah, that's a dwarf planet too. That's right. Lots of planets out there. In fact, that's a, a good part of the problem now, because where is the solar system? There's a picture of the solar system. Doug, would you send me the slide of the Milky Way? Okay. Okay. That's a picture of what our galaxy would look like if we could see it from above. There are lots of arms of stars. The Orion arm. Yes. And our sun is right about there. So you better say to Earth, solar system, Orion arms. <laughs> Now, this would all be very good if our robot mail carrier came from our part of the, the universe. But in fact, we could put, we're, <laughs> we're running to the end here. So Orion arm, just say, Doug, would you give me the slot of the universe? Now, Carl, Darian, all of you, and you, all of you young folks out there, 
These dots are not stars. These dots are galaxies much like ours. Well, well, that's a star right there. <laughs> Some of them are dusty galaxies and look red. Some of them are, have lots of young stars in them and look blue. Some of them are big because they're close to us, closer to us. Some of them are small because they're far away. Some of them are very small because they are very far away. This is our address. This is where we are. And we, you and me, your folks and everybody out here, we are all part of this universe. Our teeth have calcium <coughs> atoms in them that were made in stars. Our bones, our blood, has iron in it that was made in stars. We are part of the universe. And here's a story now about how our part, how the universe we can see came to be. So I'm not sure. Oh, that one. Yeah, you're right. That is the storybook I want to use. Okay. It's called the everything seed. Okay. Have you ever watched a seed grow? Have you ever noticed how it begins? so small, so still, so quiet, like a gift waiting to be opened. And how slowly it wakes up and begins to unfold, growing into something larger and larger and larger. If you have watched this before, then you know that whatever comes from a seed usually ends up looking very little like the seed it came from, which is also true of the very first seed. Once long, long ago, way back before the beginning, so long ago that there was no such thing as time because there was no one there to count it everywhere was a huge, deep, mysterious place, like something waiting to happen. There were no stars, no sun or moon. There was no place like Earth, and not a drop of water or a single tree or rock or flower, <clears throat> and no living beings anywhere. But in that deep waiting space was hidden the tiniest point of something no bigger than a seed. It was not a flower seed. It was not an oak tree seed. It was not a seed of corn, although all those things were included in the seed. You might call it an everything seed because that is what it became. No one knows where that first seed came from or how it was planted or how it knew in the way that only seeds seem to know how long it took to wait for just the right moment to sprout and grow. But all at once this tiny seed cradled and nourished in the rich soil of space woke up and broke open and began to unfold, unfolding and unfolding and unfolding and blossoming forth. Blossoming forth into an enormous blazing ball of bright light. Like a great grandmother sun. 
and the universe was born. Out fluttered the galaxies like storm of snowflakes swirling and gathering into the brightest, most blindingly beautiful clouds of stars. And out of those star clouds whirled our own star, the one we call the sun, and our earth, and our moon, and all the round spinning planets we have learned how to name. And this is the secret of that tiny seed. You and I, at least the stuff for you and I, were there in the very beginning. Just as the idea for each leaf on a big oak tree lies hidden inside an acorn. So we were there with all the stars and planets all the rocks and oceans, plants and animals and people, everything that is now or ever was or ever will be was inside that first tiny seed. So whenever you hold a seed in your hand and wonder and wonder what it could become. Imagine how you and all that is here once came from the tiniest seeds, tiniest speck of an everything seed before it sprouted and grew long, long ago in the way back beginning of time. Now, if this were an ordinary story, it would end right there. But this story is of the universe and keeps on unfolding. What once began in a blazing blossom of light continues every day. New plants and animals appear on the earth. New stars sprout open in the deep soil of space. These stars are scattered everywhere seeds of many kinds to help us remember. And new people are born every day with the spark of that first light, that burning still alive deep inside, waiting like the everything seed to shine in ways that are yet to be known. And so you and we are the descendants of our ancestors, the stars. How wonderful that we are a part of this immense universe. How wonderful that though we are so small. We are part of something so vast and, and wonderful. That inspires us to be wonderful and live thought on thought, deed on deed, lives worth living. And now it's time to sing the children to their song.
see you all together and to hear you and to remember all the different parts that make up our community just hearing each of your different parts in the song uh, so we will now be taking our offering i think this is a a nice moment also to remember that we are in the midst of our stewardship campaign we're finishing up soon you should in the next week or so be receiving something in the mail if you're a member um, reminding you of the opportunity to contribute financially and also to reflect on the gifts of time and talent you might offer to the community so that is coming here on our sunday morning offering we share it with a local organization and this month our partner organization is the Fairy Godmothers, which helps women in the Manhattan community with crucial expenses that they're not able to cover other ways. So please give generously. You can put your offering in the basket in the back. You can donate online by going to our website. And while we're doing the offering, uh, you're welcome to fill out a Joys and Sorrows form. Uh, which you should find on a chair nearby or if you're with us online you can type your joy or your sorrow in the chat and rob will read them later our piece for the offertory this morning is the song love is more thicker than forget with words by the unitarian poet ee e. cummings 
And this is a duet sung uh, by the group, The Story. And we're using it with special permission of them. And at a bonus, we have beautiful images to go with it, curated by our own Dick Beeman. And look carefully, the, the last image there will be one, um, a photograph by our own Mark Clark. Amen. Are there any joys or sorrows this morning from, from you all gathered here? Don't see any. How about, how about on Zoom? Did any come? Oh, here's one coming. Thank you. So this is a joy from Mary Beth. Um, joy and an invitation to um, come to the library book sale. It's back at the new location in the pavilion in City Park um, in a couple weeks, April 29th and the 30th and the 1st. So yes, let us gather together and enjoy books. It looks like there are some joys and sorrows coming in on Zoom. Doug, if you're able to bring up our Zoom host, Rob, he can read them for us. Yeah, so um, Lynn and Lauren say- Oh, and Rob, we can't hear you just yet. Hold, hold on a moment. Now, now I think we can. Okay. Uh, Lynn and Lauren say it was a joy in all caps to hear and see the choir together today. Um, and that was the that was the only joy we had this morning. I think I saw one on the screen here pop up from Judy. Um, that was a oh. Um, well, that seemed like a sorrow, but um, she says, um, my granddaughter was involved in a car accident last night. 
Um, no one was injured. Um, we are all very thankful. Oh, a joy. <laughs> I guess I need to read till the end. <laughs> <laughs> and how about how about sorrows? Are there sorrows that have come in? Um, yeah, we have one. Um, from uh, from Anna, who says, um, I may have lost my car. Um, I won't know until the mechanic sees it tomorrow. Um, I spent most of my day either in a tow truck or along the side of I-70. Um, but she did say, uh, my joy is that I did get home safely. Okay, thank you. Oh, gosh, the trials of getting getting through so let us let us hold these sorrows these joys these sorrows that people see the light in to find joy in in our hearts along with all those other joys and sorrows that remain unspoken but no less true for a moment a moment of silence There is a joke <clears throat> that uh, the reason Unitarians are such lousy singers, which is false, by the way. <laughs> You're a great congregational singing group. Um, the, the reason Unitarians are so poor at singing hymns is that they're always looking ahead to see if they agree with the words. <laughs> and and as a, that has a serious point, actually. Uh, uh, one of the things that I love about coming to the Unitarian Fellowship is that I don't say a lot of things that I don't believe. Um, I had a very nice uh, uh, dinner Thursday night, uh, uh, Maundy Thursday in the mainline Christian calendar. Um, and it was a lovely service all about the Last Supper and uh, 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 in any case, it was a lovely service, but it reminded me of why I'm a Unitarian <laughs> and, not, uh, and not a mainline Christian. So today is Easter Sunday, uh, and Christian churches everywhere are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now, most Unitarian Universalists think this is just not so, um, that dead men rise up never that even the weariest river winds at last to the sea. Um, yet we persist in, um, uh, yet they, the uh, mainline Christians, persist in using the, the language of resurrection, of life in a city of gold. Uh, and when confronted with that image of a city of gold and life after death, uh, um, my father, in the last few days of his life, said, you know those are stories that we tell to children, okay? Um, so where do we Unitarians get off singing about uh, uh, what we're going to sing in hymn 270? Uh, o day of light and gladness, and uh, 
O Lord of life eternal. We're going to say the resurrection hymn. We're going to be using these words. And so to prevent our, us from having to read ahead, I'm going to make a meditation on this hymn so that uh, when it comes time to sing it, we know what we're singing. And in each, each of us in our own way, to some extent, know why we're singing it. OK. So as I said, uh, given our general skepticism about resurrection noted above, maybe we should think about it a moment before we sing. So here goes. The first verse probably holds no problems. Uh, it goes like this. O day of light and gladness, of prophecy and song, what thoughts within us waken, what hallowed memories throng. I mean, this is, we can all get behind that. The soul's horizon widens, past, present, future blend, and rises on our vision the life that hath no end. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, the life that hath no end. Well, the second verse makes clear what is never ending about this life. And this, by the way, is my favorite verse in the whole song. Earth feels the season's joyance. The new life is the resurrected nature. Daffodils, blossoms on trees, warm weather, new children. Earth feels the season's joyance. From mountain range to sea, the tides of life are flowing, fresh, manifold, and free. This is the resurrection, the resurrection of the earth, the resurrection of, of our memories, the resurrection of more children. Um, that verse is the verse I think of when I see young children here. Uh, they are like the, the daffodils. Uh, the tides of life indeed are flowing. But then comes the third verse. O Lord of life eternal, uh, O Lord of life eternal, to thee our hearts upraise the Easter song of gladness, the Passover of praise. Thine are the many mansions, the dead die not to thee, who fillest of thy fullness time and eternity. So what's going on here? Let's pause a moment and just think a bit about life after death. Uh, I had a wonderful time uh, discussing this verse with uh, Pastor Isabel a few days ago. And I said, um, uh, yeah, as that third verse says, um, uh, the dead die not to thee. They, the dead live on in memory. But, it, I, but I said, it's a very, that's a very attenuated type of living. I mean, uh, for example, I, uh, uh, I remember my father, I remember my grandfather. I remember stories about his father, my great grandfather, uh, who's probably a bigamist, uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, that, that's another story. Um, <laughs> but about his father, That man's existence, as far as memory is concerned, is probably, or probably, I think I could defend, probably gone. Um, but then, so I, I said to Isabel, so that is a, a sort of life after death, and a good sort too, as far as it goes, but it's hardly eternal. But Isabel spoke up and pointed out that although I don't remember them, um, my ancestors molded me. My grandfather was a sharecropper, barely supporting him, a teenage sharecropper, barely supporting himself and his mother when he got a chance to go to college. That changed the the whole trajectory of the Weaver clan from sharecropping to a university professorship, retired now. And each of those people 
and so Isabella then said, and so you, Larry, affect other people, and they affect other people, and it, so it grows. Um, and the world is different because the way the people who affect who affected the people who were affected by the people who were affected by me are doing things differently. Okay, the world is different, um, and so unknown to anyone alive five hundred years in the future, uh, my ancestors and I live on. My unknown great great grandfather existed. That was true yesterday. It's still true today, and it will still be true tomorrow. And so, in that sense, is eternal. That man does not evaporate from history. He never disappears from the actual history of the world. That actual history of the world, that all-encompassing nature, that is the, the Lord of life eternal. That's something like nature itself. It is the fullness of time and eternity. So that's the way I think about that hymn, in particular, that second verse that I love. Let's now sing it, think of it as you will. It's number 270 and the words will be on the board. Those of you who grew up Methodist will recognize the, the hymn, the, the tune. and gladness of prophecy and song. But thoughts within us waken, but hallowed memory strong. The soul's horizon widens, past, present, future blend. Rises on our vision the life Thank you so much, Larry. Resurrection is a compelling idea because loss is so painful. Springtime fills us with awe, not just because of its beauty, the bird song, intricately painted Easter eggs, the flowering red bud, but because beauty has returned again this year. They may not be the same blossoms, but they're flowing forth from the same red bud tree. Oh, red bud, you seemed dead 
but now I realize you are alive and you've been alive the whole time. If winter is painful because of all that is lost, we make it through because we believe in spring. But how do we make it through the other losses in our lives? What do we believe in to make it worthwhile to go on? There's something so honest about a holiday commemorating the rebirth of a beloved person, particularly one killed unjustly, still young. There's something deep about the hope that someone who's died will come back, did come back. It's not just denial, it's also refusal to be plunged into hopelessness. When it comes to Jesus, I am convinced that the resurrection story is a brilliant, courageous, insistent insult against the institutions that wanted him dead. Oh, you think you've killed our man? Well, you've got another thing coming. Not only is he not dead, but you've unleashed the fury of a new movement that's never going away. I shared this conviction with Larry and he asked me if I knew this song. I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night, alive as you and me. Says I, but Joe, you're 10 years dead. I never died, said he. The copper buses killed you, Joe. They shot you, Joe, says I. Takes more than guns to kill him in, says Joe. I didn't die. And standing there as big as life and smiling with his eyes, says Joe, what they can never kill, went on to organize. Whether it's a prophet speaking for love, a laborer fighting for rights, or a regular guy guilty only of being black. And I'm thinking here of George Floyd, rest his soul whose face I know and you know like a friend now. We celebrate Easter every time we refuse to be plunged into hopelessness. Losses that threaten us with hopelessness can also be very personal. This week, I have been reflecting a lot on the loss of my voice. Since a severe injury six years ago when I was intubated, my vocal cords move differently. My words and song come out with extra breath, not loud. Two years ago, I had a procedure intended to increase the volume and stamina of my voice. After surgery, four days voice rest. During those four days of not talking, I started to listen. What is it my voice has to say? Not what do I want it to say, what do I use it to say, but what is its truth? There was a rich silence, serenity, something truer than words, truer than melody, a few months later, my voice was louder and that was useful, but I was aware that the moment of truth during recovery, that was the true gift of the surgery. This week I had the unwelcome surprise of losing my voice again. I don't think it's COVID. I've had a bunch of negative tests. Maybe it's the smoke from the prairie fires 
Or maybe my report at the annual meeting was just too long. <laughs> but I was plunged back into that winter of silence. It's an interesting timing during the week of Lent. A few weeks ago, I spoke to you about the power of surrender, giving up habits or material things that we cling to and finding the strenuous contours of enough. In the back of my mind, I had wanted to talk with you about disability, about the loss of ability, what it's like to give up able-bodiedness. I didn't have room for that thought in that reflection, but it came back this week loud and clear. Well, not really loud, but clear. What are the blessings of being silenced, of loss? So for me this week, I've had to upend many plans, like making phone calls and prioritize my body. I remember again that I'm not a human doing. And I've had to ask for help. Disability reminds us that we are human beings. We can only survive interdependently. Surrendering, talking, I've needed to rely on my community to speak for me and listen to me in new ways. In my quiet solitude, I listen to, to me. So healing spiritually from my loss of voice again and again is a process of remembering the abiding truth that I am worthy of my life and my community, regardless of what I say, perform, accomplish, Remembering this truth is literally putting reality back together after loss. This is how remembrance is, how resurrection is. We put things back together and they're different. So I was talking with a friend during my first night in silence this week. He's not religious, not spiritual, but I asked him if he understands or if he experiences awe or wonder. He wrote back, have you seen that YouTube video of a double rainbow that stretches from here to hear a full half circle, and I hadn't, so I went and watched the video. It's three minutes long, but apparently the rainbow was there for a full hour. The person recording the video is honestly losing his mind. He's so odd. He says, oh my God, oh my God, it's too much. What does it mean? <laughs> profound beauty, profound loss, profound pleasure. It's sometimes as difficult to bear. Their loss and joy, they're, they're both difficult to bear sometimes. What does it mean? to lose your voice, to lose a job, or a marriage, or a country, or home, a friend, a loved one, your able-bodiedness, your cancer-freeness. What does it mean? The theologian Henry Nelson Wyman believed that this search for meaning is an expression of God and of good. Life is not just a series of unfortunate events, but a series of creative events that are beautiful 
and good if we wake up and show up for them. Wyman writes, the creative event weaves a web of meaning between individuals and groups and between the organism and its environment. Out of disruptions and conflicts which would otherwise be destructive, the creative event creates vivifying contrasts of quality. It makes me think of the different colors in the everything seed. Vivifying contrasts of quality. Thus, it can utilize frustration and disaster to make life richer and more connected. This process is what makes life good. We understand good by making meaning, telling stories. He calls it qualitative meaning, the connection between events whereby present happenings enable me to feel not only the quality intrinsic to this moment, but also the qualities of many other events related to this moment, both past and future our ancestors and our descendants. Like Larry's hymn, the soul's horizon widens, past, present, future blend, and rises on our vision, the life that has no end. This is why we celebrate Easter or Equinox every year to make meaning of the rebirth, not only of the red bud and Jesus and George Floyd, but of all our losses to remember ourselves and, our, and each other. I'm not gonna lie, when my voice faded on Monday, I was disappointed and scared. But part of my mind rolled its eyes and said, oh, you again. I remember you, I remember last time we wrestled with the question, what does it mean? And I remember it was good. I remember how generously willing people are to know what I need, to know what I'm thinking, even if I have to write it down or pantomime it. And I'm such a chatterbox that even in my silence, there are so many words and ideas. I have a compulsion to express what I'm thinking, and there are workarounds. I think the Sunday service committee can attest to this, because even though I had to stop talking halfway through our meeting on Wednesday, I still managed to talk them into something through the chat box. <laughs> There is a creative force that pushes through no matter what. Take away my voice, ha. take away my walking, I will dance. When I first read Wyman, the image I had for this creative good was grass pushing up through the cracks in the sidewalk so persistently and forcefully that eventually we know it will win. We can pave paradise, but God is going to burst up through those cracks over and over again, forever. Paradise can be ignored and denied, but it'll never give up on us. The everything seed is everything. It's always at, at the heart of it. Henry Nelson Wyman loved art as a primary way to understand our experiences. And so I wonder if he knew the Unitarian poet E.E. E. Cummings, because I see the same kind of God in both of their writings, even though their styles are completely different. Wyman explained that art makes it possible to feel the quality of events with art we can feel more events more deeply without being totally exhausted or destroyed by their intensity. So we can hear the story of Jesus and empathize, but we're not destroyed 
by the loss of, of him. So art makes it possible to empathize, to quote, feel through the sensitivities of other people. One can see through a million eyes, hear through a thousand ears, both of the dead and of the living. Through art, Wyman wrote, I'm connected to an infinitely complex and far-reaching network of telepathic feelers, which, which reach from the tips of my nerves far out into the complexities of society. And I would say the universe. Art brings me to the secret of many hearts, he said. E.E. E. Cummings brings us to the secrets of many hearts. In his description of love, we heard earlier, more thicker than forget, more thinner than recall, and more it cannot die than all the sky which is higher than the sky. He knows the truth of resurrection, that the red bud blossoms won't make it, but the underlying love is too thick and too thin to forget to make new blossoms next year. And E.E. E. Cummings knows the God of the everything seed. In my favorite poem, he says, I thank you, God, for most this amazing day for the leaping greenly spirits of trees and a blue true dream of sky and for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes. And he goes on, and I really should stop because it's copyrighted material and we don't have permission to use it But on YouTube, but it just keeps pushing up through the cement of intellectual property rights. He goes on, I who have died am alive again today, and this is the sun's birthday. Get it? We die, the sun dies, but it comes back. We come back, he says, this is the birthday. And he would have said Earth Day if he'd known about it. This is the birthday of life and love and wings and of the gay, great happening, illimitably everything. There are so many threats to our planet and there is so much death of species, ecologies, people, languages, and it's not okay. But the earth is not voiceless, no matter how many songbirds die. She will always find new ways to say her truth. When will we stop using her to say things and listen to what she has to say? And so, like our Christian friends who use the energy of Easter to nourish their resolve, to organize, to stop the crucifixion of more brown men, let us join them. And let us use the energy of Earth Day to nourish our resolve to organize, to stop the crucifixion of our planet to stay strong enough to show up, we have to have hope. We have to have art. We have to have each other. We have to have joy. And we have to have song. So please rise in body, spirit, and song, however you sing. We'll now join together in hymn 61. Lo, the earth wakes again.
so be it. Hallelujah. Go forth and enjoy the day.